Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I am joined by Ramit Sethi. Ramit is an entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, podcast host of I Will Teach You To Be Rich, and now TV host of Netflix, How To Get Rich, where he teaches people how to live their rich life. His unique approach to managing finances is sometimes different from the traditional advice as he advises individuals to spend money on things you love. You heard that, guys. Spend it on what you love, but cut back on the things you do not. We're going to explore everything within Ramit's unique approach to personal finance management and how he was able to diversify his methods into a multifaceted and successful business career. I also just think it's so cool that you took personal finance and you brought it to Hollywood. Number 10, top 10 on Netflix with this show. Ramit, thank you so much for being on Trading Secrets. Thanks for having me. We are excited to have you. This is awesome. And one of the reasons we're so excited to have you is because watching your show, episode one, it was one of the first things that were said. It came out of your mouth. Ever wonder how much people make? Ever wonder how much people spend? How much is in their checking account? And I think about my life. Since I was like six years old, those are the things I always thought about. Yeah. That's what always drove me to finance. And with Trading Secrets, that was literally the mission of what we were doing two years ago. So tell me this, why is it in 2023 where people are willing to talk about literally anything and on social media in front of strangers, <laughs> but they're still not willing to talk about finances? What's your take on why that is? It's the last taboo. And there's a great research study that I cite in my book of how people are more willing to talk about their sex lives than their credit card debt. That's real. Oh yeah. And when, when you think about it, it kind of starts to make sense. Number one, in our culture, money is something that is both secret. We don't talk about how much we make. We certainly don't talk about how much we spend, but it's also way out there. Mm -hmm. We like pictures of people in Bora Bora on a Tuesday. We post pictures of a brand new coat that we bought. And so we have this duality, but no one really teaches us how to think about money. Mm -hmm. The only things we hear about money are negative. It's like, you should be cutting back on lattes. I'm not the latte. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you You're that. you not the fact, latte police? No. It, honestly, a $5 cup of coffee every day is not going to change your financial life. 100%. If you like it, go buy it. Yep. We're taught all these confusing words, 401k, Roth IRA. We don't really understand how it affects me. And so we just go, you know what? I'll deal with that later. Mm -hmm. And I have never wanted to do that. I want people to see when they think of money right now, they think spreadsheets and boring accounts. I look at money and I see an amazing trip out for cocktails with my friends or a trip to Disneyland with your kids or a two month exotic trip or beautiful clothes. That's how I see money. Gotcha. So your relationship with money then is like always glass half full of opportunity to create happiness in your life. Then. A rich life. Yeah. A rich, and a, life. a rich life can be different for everyone. So okay. a rich life can be traveling two months a year. It can be a beautiful handbag okay. or it could be picking up your kids from school every yeah. afternoon. And I love hearing people's rich life because it's always different once we dive in. And that's why I always say your rich life is yours. I like that. I like that. I think that's great. But one of the things I want to talk about too is just breaking the ice of this conversation. Because so many people back home be like, easy for you to say, Jason, that's what you talk to people about all day on your podcast. Easy for you to say, Ramit, this is what you do all day. But it's really challenging for them to have these conversations with either their family members, their loved ones, their significant others. And so I remember one of the couples you had said, they got in the show, they go, what the hell did I sign up for? Like, yeah. I have a stranger coming here to talk about finances. Yeah. And I was thinking, about in life how often we do talk to strangers about things that are private think mm -hmm. about this like i go to a dentist appointment they know all my history i go to a doctor i tell them everything i go to a therapist just met them they know all my deepest yeah. darkest secrets but money still is like that secret so yeah. you have to go in and have these conversations that people aren't comfortable having let's put yourself in their shoes what can they do without you there to start having these conversations where do you start well, the good news is that they can only go up since no one really talks about money at all. You yeah. have to think, imagine most people who have been married 10 or 15 years, they don't even know what they themselves believe about money. Their spouse most certainly does not know what they believe. So you've got the blind leading the blind. And in my opinion, that's actually an amazing place to start because you're starting from essentially ground zero. So the way that you can have conversations with a partner is to start off really gently. It's like, hey, when you were a kid, 
What do you remember your parents saying about money? Do you remember them saying any phrases? For example, my parents used to say, money doesn't grow on trees, or you can't afford that. Those are very common phrases. What do you remember? And then you can say something like, you know, if, if you could spend more on anything, what would it be? Mm. Now, that's a juicy question. That's a juicy one. And it's, it's an easy one. It's, it's, easy. Fun. it's a fun one. It's fun, right? Yeah. I'm not sitting here saying, what's your asset allocation in your 401k? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. No one wants that. It's super defensive. But what do you wish you could spend more on? What do you think we should spend more on at some point in the future? And now you're getting curious. Now you're talking. And then the key is you leave on top. You do not have to get to the bottom of every single money belief you have in your first conversation. It's literally, hey, what do you remember your parents saying? What do you think would be cool to spend some money on this year? Okay, cool. Bye. And leave. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the appetizer, guys, because I'm not going to go into all personal finance coaching yet from Ramit. We're going to get into that. So I have more appetizers before the dinner. But if you have credit card debt, you have student debt, you just want to learn where to even start with investing all the takes they are coming. Before I get into those, I got to let my curiosities drive this conversation because you, you've had a successful business career. You wrote a book back in 2009, brought it back to the surface. It's absolutely crushed it. But to be successful in business and have a book that's impacted others is one thing to then have a Netflix show come out in which they pick you to be the host to then be in the top 10 trending all shows on Netflix guys you know the shows out there love is blind circle all these huge actors and actresses a finance show is top 10 how are you feeling given everything that's happened and what's the whirlwind like right now I I can't believe it and I've been doing my business for 20 years so I thought I had seen a lot Writing a book, as a writer, that's very gratifying to me. I know how to sit down and write. It takes me years. And then when it comes out, I'm very proud of it. When Netflix approached, I had been doing my business for about 15, 17 years. And I never woke up and said, I want to be on TV. Sure, I'm like an internet nerd. I like to sit on Twitter. I make a few jokes and then I take a nap. I'm like, <laughs> that was a good day. So they reached out and I remember I took the email to my wife and I was like, look at this. And my first inclination was, I don't believe it. Yeah. That's why I clicked on the from. Yep. And I was like, wait a minute, at Netflix.com? <laughs> the only emails they send me are like, what's coming out this weekend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and then in that email, they <laughs> or, said- Or your monthly rate went up. That's exactly. now 10 bucks. <laughs> I go, and the second thing they said was, should we talk to you about setting up a meeting or do you have representation? I didn't even know what representation was. <laughs> I'm like, what, what is that? So I, I speak to my wife. She was very encouraging. She said, do you, do you want to do this? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I kind of feel like it, but kind of not. I don't know. She's like, if you know, you've been doing this for so long, almost 20 years, yeah. maybe it's time to take the message to a larger audience. And that, that got me opening my mind up. But in my head, I was thinking like, I'm comfortable on Instagram. Sure. I'm comfortable writing on my newsletter, but going into somebody's house and talking about money is the most intimate thing you can do in America. Yeah, yeah. Being invited into someone's house and then they open up their financials. Right. That, that had me nervous, but I talked to the team and I, I will tell you, I told Netflix when we started discussing it, I said, guys, I think I'm ready, but the one thing I don't want to do is you know, fly to some couple in Peoria, Illinois, and tell them you're spending too much on asparagus. Yeah, yeah, yeah That's just yeah, not yeah. my thing. No, it's no. so depressing. Yeah, and they were great. They were like, "No, we want you, and we want your philosophy." And they gave broad creative control. That's amazing, and that was awesome. That is really yeah. cool. What is the audition process like? Did they know that it was going to be Ramit, or did they no. go through a process? They of didn't. Like you and everyone else. Like, uh, how'd that okay. Go? Oh, you mean for me? For, to be the host, like they oh. reached out to you, but did they, did they bring you amongst like a hundred different candidates? Ten kids? Was it an audition? Like, no. how did it work? By the time they came to me, they knew they, they wanted. Knew they you. wanted me. Did you ever ask them how they found you, or like how they went through the vetting process? Of course I did. Yeah, I want to know it? every detail. Yeah. Like, tell me how this happened. So they. Many networks had been hunting for a money show for many years. Okay. And it started to heat up around 2017. I started to get inquiries from a number of folks. Production companies started to reach out. But inside of Netflix, there was an appetite just like in any other network. I know that there are some folks who had read my book and who followed me. 
and were really big advocates. Like they would hand out my book. They even told me this on the first call. They're like, we have this guy, he hands out your book like candy. I was like, hold it right there. <laughs> Whatever deal we're about to cut, the price just quadrupled. <laughs> and they were like, ha ha ha. And I was like, ha ha ha, no, I'm not either. kidding though. <laughs> so there were allies. And I think that when it comes to making a TV show about money, yeah. you know, there hasn't really been one done in about 20 years. Yeah, It's hard. Yeah, Money, most people think it's boring. boring. I don't, but nobody wants to sit around looking at some pocket protector person you know pulling out a spreadsheet sure and so you got to have some personality you got to have a philosophy and my philosophies are you know to spend extravagantly on the things you love mm -hmm. as long as you cut costs mercilessly on the things you don't having lived in new york having gone out to boozy brunches and traveled i know what i like to spend money on and then i've also grown up you know the son of immigrants so i know across a wide spectrum i think that's part of what attracted them to me sharing a philosophy on money. Okay, another cool thing about the next Flick show, and guys, we're gonna get into all the personal finance stuff. These are the curiosities of what he's done that's brought him to become an, I'm gonna say international now, sensation in just a week, like it's wild. Your book is in a lot of the episodes, your products, you promote your podcast. Was that part of the deal? Because I was shocked that they would allow you to promote so much of your personal products on like a huge platform they gave. Well, that's a good question. You know, the fact is the podcast is real. So I talk to couples every week where they come on the show and some of them have $800,000 in debt. And another episode, I think it's episode 20 or so, he says, help, my wife is gonna divorce me. 21 years married. She says I'm too cheap. Meanwhile, their net worth is over $13 million. Jeez. So you hear these really juicy stories and the show was just another way to show people, hey, I'm actually deeply connected with real people. Yeah. So on any given day, even before Netflix, I was getting roughly 2000 messages a day through email, DM, et cetera. And I read every single one. I can't reply anymore, but I read every single one. And can you imagine the kind of stories people tell me about oh, like it's got to be night like, and day. it's like all over the yeah place. i've seen it it's all. like everything everything professional athletes although the funny thing is i don't know anything about sports so <laughs> someone will write me they'll be like oh i'm from the eagles and i'm like is that a soccer team <laughs> and they're and they never reply after yeah I yeah, say. yeah. They're like, you're not a fan Come but on. like you you really hear a wide spectrum mm -hmm. and for me that allows me to stay connected at all levels the book i'll tell you one funny thing about the book yeah so I, I have two books that in the show I handed out. Mm -hmm. One of them is my classic, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, which yep. has been around for over 10 years. That's the nuts and bolts. And the other one is this journal that I created to help people design their rich life. So you'll notice that the cover of that book is black. Yes. That's not the real cover. And I was ah. like, hey, I want this beautiful blue cover. And they were like, no, it will look too much like an infomercial. So they said that to me. So I, I noticed that cover actually. Yeah. And I noticed it wasn't. It's same. black. And so I go, all right, fine. Look, I'm not here to sell books. I'm here to get my message out. Yeah. And if people resonate with my message, they're going to find my stuff. Yeah. So in the show, you'll see, you know, a couple times I slide it across the table, but it's just black. You can't even see what it says. Yeah. And the day the show came out, people went to every bookstore and it sold out across the country. And wow. my mind, that really blew my mind. Because yeah. imagine not only did they go to Amazon and buy every copy and it sold out immediately becoming in the top 100 on Amazon, then they went to every retail Barnes and Noble and independent bookstore and it sold out everywhere. That is crazy. That is what, because it's, I'm a very transparent guy. I always keep it real. I was watching your show last night. Evan was in the room next to me. Oh, Evan's not here, but I go, Evan, Ramit must have paid no. to get this job because it was such beautiful placement and it's yeah. done so well i mean that's remarkable let's talk about that though because this it's like 20 years of work yeah and, and you've had a ton of success before that but overnight it multiplies at like a what would you say a 20x 30x uh, like in a 24 hour period yeah it's hard it's hard to kind of stomach the idea that i think more people have heard about me in the last week than in 20 years and i'm like wait yeah. what but you're following on instagram has probably yeah. what doubled yeah podcast, it's, it's gone book up sales, podcast everything. well i'll give you some numbers just so you can see the effect yeah we're big numbers guys here okay too. so my book became number one on all of amazon my journal became in the top 10 
at, at a given time in personal finance, there was my book was number one, the audio book was number two, the journal was number three. So, and, and as an author, I know what it takes to get there. And my mind was completely blown. Podcast became number five or six on all of Apple. The show, of course, on Netflix, top, top 10. 10, up to number six, which is mind blowing again, because yeah. money, again, that to me says we have a deep craving to understand how money really works True. and make it fun. True. True. It does not have to be boring spreadsheets. Yeah. So all of these things happen. Of course, my newsletter, my social media grew like crazy. But what I, what I love, honestly, the thing that moved me the most, so people have been sending me DMs. Like yeah. I can't keep up anymore. Yeah, I'm sure. And they send pictures watching the show in their living room. And what's really cool is seeing pictures of people's living rooms from across the world. Yeah. So they'll tag me, I'm from Luxembourg, Portugal, Brazil. And you can tell a lot by looking at someone's living room, Yeah. but they're all watching the same show. Yeah. And I was like, now this is kind of like humanity. It's kind of beautiful that we're all watching the same show translated into dozens of languages in 190 countries that felt really good. Yeah, and it's just it's good for the space of money management, yes. for financial management. It's good for the health of the entirety of the world because yeah. these are things we got to start talking we gotta, about. We got to know them. We got to feel more confident about our money mm -hmm. instead of always shrinking. You can actually see it on the show. There are some people who are extremely confident. Changes. Yeah, and then I start talking about money, and yeah. this is what they do. Watch. Yeah, they you could shrink. totally see they look down. Yeah. And, and I want people to feel confident, even yeah. if you have credit card debt you can be confident. Right. Even if you do not know every technicality of investing, you can be confident. And that's what I wanted people to show. Like, actually, money can be fun, yeah. and you can take control from whatever level you're at. I often say, some people say, like, this show for Trading Secrets, are like, how is it done so well? Podcasts are tough. And I say, because we're, we're tapping into money. And yeah. the, the only correlation I could connect to is, like, call her daddy. Call her daddy, what they do is they tap into sex. That's the taboo subject. Yeah. You talked about shame. We had a sex coach on once just talk about her career track. But one of the things she said is the biggest issue that people have when I meet with them is they feel shame. And it's kind of interesting that the taboo topics, whether it's money or sex or therapy, yeah. whatever it is, all connects back to confidence and shame shame and embarrassment yeah. of not knowing we yeah. all kind of have this belief that we should somehow know about sure. money how yeah nobody taught us yeah and the people who taught you typically were people who didn't know themselves your parents so i don't think anyone should be ashamed of not knowing about money and i actually feel a lot of compassion because in my life there are areas that i knew nothing about right. which i feel like everyone else knew about right for me it was physical fitness growing up i didn't know how to debt we didn't go to the gym I was busy doing spelling bees and, and winning. So, <laughs> and winning. <laughs> so like we never used the word protein in our family. Yeah. Never. Yeah. We just, we didn't do it. Yeah. And so when I got into college in my 20s, I looked around and it seemed like everyone knew this thing that I didn't. And when I started, I had a lot of beliefs in my head. You know, I used to joke and call myself skinny Indian guy. Okay which I wish I hadn't because I think the equivalent with money is a lot of people will say, I'm just bad with money yeah. or I'm bad with math. Mm -hmm. And you say that enough times, you start to believe it. Totally. I believed it about my physical fitness. And it took me unwinding those beliefs and getting a lot of help from trainers and friends to realize that I could actually make a change. And right. so when I see somebody who feels like they don't really know about money, I feel a lot of compassion because I felt the same way in other parts of my life. Yeah, and I think to your point of what comes out really does become a reality and comes yeah. right back to you. There's no yeah. doubt about it. I have two questions left yeah. for you. What how, what do you do from here, right? Just in last couple of weeks, you're blowing up all these followers, podcast is taking off. What's the next step business career strategy wise? Well, do, do, running my business for 20 years, I think I've seen a lot come and go. Yeah. So I've seen folks in my industry come and go. I've seen products that blew up. Some are still around, some have not. And I do have a profitable business with a solid base and an amazing team. So that feels really good. What I now use to guide my big decisions is, number one, am I going to have fun? If I'm going to have fun, then my audience is going to have fun. Mm -hmm. And if we're all having fun, there's probably money to be made. Yeah, That's the genesis of the podcast. Totally. I wrote up a vision doc when I started it. And a little thing I haven't actually really mentioned much is that the reason I started my podcast was I knew my Netflix show was going to start filming. Okay. And I was like, I want to practice. I want to get really good before 
this comes out. And so I launched it. I was talking to couples, really honing my ability to ask questions and get people to open up. Yeah. But in that vision doc for the podcast, I wrote, number one, the goal of this is for me to have fun. Okay. That's number one. Number one. And the audience is going to have fun. Number two, here are 20 sample titles I want to do. And if I stopped having fun, done. It's over. So that's what guides what I'm doing next. That's such a good way to live. Yeah. All right. Of all the businesses you've had, from the ones that you founded, mm -hmm. and the book, and now Netflix, and the podcast, which is the most lucrative? Which do you think will be the most lucrative? Wow, that's an interesting question. The most lucrative has been the digital programs that my team and I create. Okay. So people will come... They'll hear about me and go on social media, newsletter, whatever. At a certain point, they're going to hear about one of our programs. Okay. For example, people want to know how to start a business and earn more. Sure. They might join our earnable program. That's two to $3,000. Okay. They might want to find a dream job and negotiate a $25,000 raise. They'll join our dream job program. And if they join a program, what do they get? So some of them will be a, a series of very extensive playbooks and videos. For example, dream job, we will show you exactly how to negotiate your salary, okay. including videos where I bring people in and we negotiate against each other. That's cool. It's very juicy. Some of them will actually have coaching involved. So they'll okay. get in small groups with me and they'll get, get help refining their idea or learning how to do sales calls. Like live coaching. Yeah. Get access yeah. To. And I'll okay. do one. In fact, I have a live coaching call for Earnable tonight. Okay. So that part of the business is probably the most lucrative. Digital programs, high margin, and we've learned how to scale them. Okay. What will be most lucrative in the long term? Gosh, it's hard to beat that, but we definitely have new revenue streams. For example, sure. we just started running ads on our podcast okay. like three months ago. Sure. We're totally new to the game. Yeah. And that has done very well. Yeah. Your podcast is blowing up. It's going to continue yeah. to blow up. Thank you. It is exciting, exciting times. Yeah. Man, I love it. I, my friends all told me, I have some, a lot of big podcast friends, yeah. and they've been telling me for seven, eight years, they're like, you need to get a podcast. Get on it. But I never had an idea. Yeah. And I guess in a way, I'm like a poker player. I just want to check until I'm ready to go, and then I go all in. Yeah. And the podcast with the Netflix show coming and a random couple who once pinged me during COVID and they were two vets, veterinarians. Okay. And they were like, we have $525,000 of debt. Can you help us? And I was like, all right, I'll help you, but you got to do it live on Instagram live. And they were like, okay. I was like, wait, what? I said, yeah, <laughs> just and like I, that. <laughs> and then I was like, and you have to share all your numbers. They said, fine. I started speaking to them Good for, for five minutes and I knew this is the podcast. This, this is, is the it. concept. This is it. Okay. The last thing I want to do is I want to make this your story relatable for people at home. They might not be business experts. They might not be personal finance, finance yeah. experts, but they are a niche in something yeah. that they need to get that message out. And it would be a dream for them to get the message out the way you have. What are the first steps? Is it, is it writing a book? Is it no. doing a newsletter? Is it, what are the first steps? If you have a skill set and you need people to see it, what do you recommend? I heard this really good idea about one of the studios and they create shows for a small amount of people to love, not a large amount of people to like. So okay. they want to create something so good that a small number of people loves it. If I were just starting out with being a personal organizer or a fashion line or something, I would create something so good that a small number of people would rave about it and love it. In order to do that, what does it mean? It means you probably need to have a strong point of view. Yep. You can't look like everybody else and sound like everybody else. You've got to actually be talking to prospects. And I mean talking a lot, emailing them, talking on the phone, texting them. You've got to have a direct relationship. Yeah. And then ultimately you have to sell something. Yeah. People can say they love your stuff, but the ultimate sign that they love it is they pull out their credit card and they happily pay. Mm -hmm. If you can do those three things with 10 people, and then translate it to 25 people. Gosh, you have a really nice trend. That's exactly how I started my business. That is a brilliant piece of advice, guys. Don't focus on what, especially now with social media, everyone's trying to go like viral and uh -uh. trying to like get the big hit. Just build that small loyal community yeah. and slowly, slowly it will go. And you never know, might be a Netflix show and go overnight. All right, so that's a little career direction from Ramit. So fascinating. Let's get into some 
we need them meet now. Now it's dinner. There's so many issues right now people are having. Credit card debt, interest rates, real estate, student debt. They don't know where to turn and everything they read right now is fearful. Like there's yeah. just so much alarmist things happening in the world. So before we get into some of the specifics of finance, what advice do you have for someone who's just like, I'm stuck. I don't even know which direction to go because everything I'm hearing is conflicting. Well, I agree with them. I think that most of the advice people hear out there is negative. Yeah. And you'll hear people saying, in this economy, yeah. I go, what are you talking about? You've been saying that for the last 20, 20 years. years. The economy has been phenomenal yeah, yeah, yeah. for a lot of people. And no matter what people say, in this economy, I go, stop talking like that. Yeah. I'm doing a lot of press right now. And a lot of journalists, they'll start off by saying, times are really tough. I go, okay, they are tough for certain groups in certain situations but we're not gonna start talking about that because that automatically sets the tone as money is something negative. Bad, and no, that's what it's gonna, always bad. Exactly, and if you've only been taught that money is bad, yeah. then how are you ever gonna feel good about it? Yeah. So I always start off by saying, tell me what your rich life is. I wanna start there. Even if you are in $25,000 of credit card debt or 200K of student loan debt, what is your rich life? You wanna do it right now? Yeah, let's do All it. All right, let's, let's do, do it. Let's do a practice. Let's do it right now, and yes. then everybody listening, play along. Yes, right. I love it. So what is your rich life? My rich life is it's freedom mm -hmm. and it's having the flexibility that if I want to adjust my schedule yeah. or do something impromptu, I can do it with the people I love and not always having to be worried about like, will I have enough? Will it go away? Okay, love it. Let's dive into the freedom and impromptu thing. Can you give me an example in the last month or two where you did something impromptu and you just loved it? Impromptu. Okay. Yeah. I actually had a childhood buddy I grew up with. He's always been a big WWE fan. Mm -hmm. I was able to get us connected into double into WrestleMania. Yeah. It probably wasn't the best like financial or career decision just because I had so much other going on. But I was like, you know what? Let's go. We flew out to LA, rent, went to WrestleMania, had the time of our lives. Love it. Okay. Awesome. So now I want to ask you a couple more questions. When you think about spending your money, what do you love spending on? Not just like, but love. Yeah. I love spending it on experiences uh -huh. and I love spending it on people I love and trust. Okay, okay. Experiences like what? Traveling, going out to dinner, going to shows, okay. entertainment, essentially doing things that just create ex like things I won't forget and happiness and joy mm -hmm. uh, and things that, you know, time is so finite. So being able to do things that are like once in a lifetime, if that makes love sense. Love it. Pick one. Would it be eating out? Or would it be travel for you? Let's say travel. Travel. Okay, great. So that example, what do you love spending money on? I call it a money dial because we can turn these dials up or down. Okay. So the most common answer is food, eating out. Travel is number two, oh, which wow. is yours. Very common. Basic dude, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> number three is health and wellness. Okay. And then four is mine, which is convenience. And then there's a whole bunch convenience more. Convenience is a good yeah. one. Yeah. Now here's my second question for you. If you could quadruple the amount you spent on your money dial, mm -hmm. on travel, what would it look like and feel like for you? Oh, wow. You want me to go there? Yes, tell me. Okay. It's quadruple. Yeah. I would say like first class or maybe even have the ability here and there to do like a private jet. Uh -huh. It would just be paying for the convenience, yeah. like top tier food, getting in, getting out, five-star hotels. That's what it would look like. Love it. Take me on a specific trip. Where would the next place you're going? Italy. Italy. Okay. So you're going to go first class, Italy. Yeah. Lay and down how, bed. I how are you getting thing. to the airport? I am. Oh, I like this. I want a driver. You want a driver. Okay. Very good. So you get to the airport. Do you have bags in your hand or is someone taking the bags for you? I could carry the bags. Okay. I can handle that part. I personally, <laughs> I, I like this. I love the idea of walking through an airport with my hands Nothing. free. Some people go, I don't care. All right. So you get there and when you land, what happens? Where are you staying? I want to stay at like an unbelievable, like a winery. I want to stay at a winery. Family nice. Family winery. Not, and who's going with you? It's going to be my fiance and I. Amazing. Okay. So we could go on and on. I, I want. By the way, out. I feel great. Like exactly. you talk about the dials. Right now I'm feeling. thinking things. I, ha I haven't spent time yeah. to just sit back and think about these things. And now the images are going to my yes. brain as you're asking me. This is. I see it. I exactly. see the winery. Okay. So for everyone, like the smile on your face yeah. is irresistible. Whenever people talk about something they love spending money on, we instinctively know. We all have it inside of us for the thing we love to spend on. Now, when I ask them the second question, most people, they smile, 
but they've never thought about it. Okay. And I think we heard some of that here, but you, you've thought about it a bit. Most people are like, they've never thought about it because we've all been taught that money is only for restriction. Yep. It's actually shocking to imagine thinking about spending more mm -hmm. because we've all been taught to cut back 5% on broccoli, 5% on coffee, 5% <laughs> on taxis. Yeah. And I, I always challenge that because if you can't imagine spending more on the things you love, then how are you ever going to make changes to your current finances? Right. So I love the vision you painted. What you did really well was to get specific. Mm -hmm. I want a driver. I, w I don't mind taking my bags and I want this hotel. The first time people answer this question, they tend to be pretty vague. They okay. go, I want to travel. And I go, okay, Tell where? They go, Europe. I go, and where? <laughs> Tell me what seat place. on the airplane you want to sit on. Tell right. me what you want to eat as an appetizer. Right. That's the level of specificity. Because when you get specific and vivid with your rich life, suddenly now you have a reason to make changes. Mm -hmm. And that might mean accelerating your debt payoff. It might mean stopping paying 1% to a financial advisor because you're getting financially bled dry yep. or whatever. But now you have a vision. Without that, you're just sitting here operating one transaction after another. Okay, so I'm gonna act as my listeners here. Ramit, I'm with you. I'm now sitting at home, I'm listening to this. I have the vision, I know what I want. And for the first time, I actually feel pretty good about yep. this whole money thing. But I got, I got issues and I don't know where to start. All right. Where do you tell someone in like a general statement for the thousands of people listening back home, where do you start? I want you to know four numbers. These are the four numbers that I track for myself and I want everyone to be able to track these four numbers. Okay. This should take you less than 15 minutes. All right, so I'm gonna give you the numbers right now. The first is your fixed costs. So fixed costs should be 50 to 60% of your take home pay right. that's after tax right now within fixed cost that would be your rent or mortgage any debt you're paying off every month utilities groceries mm -hmm. car payment things that are fixed okay if you know that you actually know a huge amount Big piece. that's number one number two is your savings ideally should be five to ten percent of take home pay okay. for a lot of people it's zero the third is investments Again, five to 10% of take home. I'd like for that to be higher, but okay. And the fourth is actually my favorite category, guilt-free spending. Mm -hmm. This is going out. This is traveling to Italy. It's surprising your fiance with a beautiful dinner or a coat or a bag or both of you going to get massages. That number, 20 to 35% of take home pay. That's a lot. Pretty good. Yeah. So what this does, if you know these four numbers, okay. All you got to do to find these numbers is pull out the last month of spending okay. and approximate it. Really do not agonize over this or that. The goal is to get it 85% of the way there. Okay. And you're going to look and you're going to suddenly realize, oh my gosh, my fixed costs are 85%. That's <laughs> very common. People overspend on their fixed costs. Of course. Once you know these four numbers, suddenly you have the pieces of the puzzle and you can start to adjust them. Okay. And I can tell you right now that when I talk to couples who fight over money, oftentimes they'll be fighting over someone's target spend right. for like 20 years. And I look at their numbers and I can instantly tell what's going on. They think it's about target, but I know that they overspend on their mortgage. So they actually are fighting about the mortgage, but they think it's about target. Because if their mortgage was positioned correctly, they wouldn't be fighting about yeah. target. Yeah, and honestly, you shouldn't be fighting about the price of pickles. Yeah. You shouldn't be fighting about $25 here or there. Yeah. It's not the point. It's almost always people overspending on their housing costs and their car. Okay. As simple as that. You also have a unique take on renting versus buying. And mm -hmm. we know now, I thought I saw that 3 million Americans, their couples are making over $150,000 a year yeah. and they are renting. So obviously the trend that you're supporting is a trend that's happening in the United States. It's up 87% since 2016 to 2021 of people with higher incomes yeah. that are renting versus buying. Give us your take on it. So I rent by choice and I could go and buy a place in cash today but I don't. And the reason for that is something that is going to sound shocking, yeah. but it's not, it's not controversial in my opinion at all, yeah. which is that sometimes it can actually be a better financial decision to rent than to own. Let me explain, because a lot of people listening are going, this guy just said the sky's <laughs> green. This makes no <laughs> sense. I've never heard that. <laughs> okay. In America, we have these beliefs. Mm -hmm. They are taught so deeply. 
I call them invisible scripts. They're so deeply believed that they're invisible to us. And one of the deepest beliefs we have in America, the American dream, in yeah. fact, is you have to own a home. And so we have all these associated phrases. You're throwing money away on rent. Funny, no one ever says you're throwing money away at a restaurant. You're paying your landlord's mortgage. Really, are you worried about the sushi owner's restaurant mortgage that you're paying? <laughs> no, they, they are said so many times they're almost religious mm -hmm. because they are impervious to logic. Let me give you an example. I've lived in San Francisco, New York, LA, three very expensive cities. Sure. In each of those cities, it was cheaper for me to rent than to own. When I lived a few blocks from here, yep. let's say that my rent was $3,000 a month. I kept a very close eye on the market. There was a building right next to me. Yep. Same square footage, same view, same number of bathrooms and bedrooms. It would have cost $6,400 a month to own when I factored in all the phantom costs, taxes, interest, maintenance, opportunity cost, et cetera. So I didn't want to own. I didn't want the maintenance. Yep. I just said, I'm going to keep renting. I took the difference and I invested it. And I made way more than I ever would have made hmm. owning. So what's my message? It's not that owning is bad. It's that you need to run the numbers on the biggest purchase of your life. Yeah. And you should never feel guilty about renting. So what are some things that people should look at, like the rent to own ratio? What are things yes. that you consider are like big resources to make that decision? Here's a great number that most people do not think of at all. Yeah. Your total housing costs should be roughly less than 28% of gross income. Let me give you an example. Total housing costs means not just your mortgage, it means repairing the sprinklers. It means the roof repair that costs $19,000 nine years from now, <laughs> you need to actually spread that out. It means the interest that you're gonna pay, which yep. most people are not aware of. and Which is fluctuating like crazy. Yeah, yeah, and the opportunity cost of however much you put for your down payment, what you could have made in the market. Now, most people are like, I, I don't want to calculate all that shit. So you know what they do? <laughs> You're instead? supposed to make this fun. Really. Yeah. They, here's what they do. They, for the biggest purchase of their life, they go to their realtor. You do not ever trust a realtor's financial <laughs> advice. They go, oh, what should I buy? And the realtor tells them the worst two words on earth, monthly payment. Mm -hmm. People make the worst financial decisions on big purchases because of monthly payments. Think about right. it. They go to a realtor who's incentivized, incentivized to, to get you to spend that. more. And... Th literally or a car salesman right? that's well that's what Same they do for thing. number two that's number two chet, chet the car salesman right. goes oh what do you want your monthly payment to be that's how financially unsavvy people buy right you never make a large purchase based on monthly payment you now that you've listened to this are always going to be thinking tco total cost of ownership like so that. just to make a simple example a lot of people come to me they have trucks really yeah. expensive they go, Ramit, I need this truck. I go, really, why do you need this truck? They drive 2.3 miles on concrete road to get to their job in insurance. They go, I need the truck. I go, whatever. <laughs> the $75,000 truck they bought, if you factor in all the phantom costs, sure. insurance, gas, repairs, all of it, it ends up costing them like $105,000, dollars mm. Now, if I say to them, would you have bought a truck if you knew it was 108? They go, no way, I can't afford that. I go, but that's what you bought. Yeah. So you've got to run the numbers on the biggest purchase of your life. Yeah. I also like the idea of, okay, so run the numbers, total cost ownership. It's great. I also like the idea of like backing into where money's made. Mm -hmm. We are taught so many messages in our life. Like you had said, buy the home. That's the dream, right? Only look at monthly payment. But if you back into it, that system, those messages are what are creating massive, massive profits yeah. for the people at the top. Yeah. What, like a credit card. Where else can you get something where you're actually, it behooves them yeah. if you don't pay. Yeah. It behooves them if you throw something away. Like yeah. what a wild system that it, is. It is wild. And you know, sometimes, sometimes when my wife and I travel, yeah. we, we wish it were just a little easier to eat healthier yeah. you know like when we're at home we, we kind of know our environment but when we're out we're like gosh it's a little hard i wish it were just a little easier i feel the same way about money for everybody yeah i wish it were just a little easier i wish you didn't have to understand all these things and i wish you didn't have people trying to trick you out of your money so when you go to buy a house for example you're basically told you should spend this much and the bank will give you way more than you can comfortably afford you're never taught about phantom costs. Never. They just say, here's your monthly payment. Yeah. Everything is stacked against you. And 
I don't know. I root for the underdog. Me so too. I want people to know how to go into battle for these big purchases so that if you want to buy a house and you run the numbers, you go, yes, I know exactly what I can afford. I know that even if one of us loses our job, we'll be okay. And I am confident. I love that. All right. I'm a big fan of the underdog. I'm a big fan of giving the people the information they need so that they can navigate accordingly, yeah. not what the people that are selling to them Correct. are telling them. And we've had a ton of big real estate brokers here. I love them. You guys love them. They're super successful. But even they say, you know, I'm going to tell you what's going to make the market look good, right? Because that is my job. Let's get into some like underdog remit top rapid fire rules of like just in general i'm gonna say a topic you give me the rules you got is that it. cool credit cards do you have a rule on how to manage them or never never pay credit card debt you can use them yep if you spend enough go ahead and get a nice credit card with benefits i use a chase sapphire reserve i use a fidelity two percent cash back and just for pure fun i use an amex platinum for the lounges but i spend a lot and i pay it off every month got it Pay it off in full for the people that are searching for the right credit card. Yeah. What's your biggest piece of advice? Get a simple 2% cashback card and move on with your life. Okay. I love it. All right. Student debt. How should people manage it, especially yeah. with all the balls up in the air about forgiveness? First of all, it's okay to have student debt. It's not the worst thing in the world. Graduating from college for the vast majority of people means you're going to earn way more than a non-college graduate. Right. So if you have student loan debt, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Two things I want to point out. Number one, you can actually shave off years of your payments if you run a debt payoff calculator. Mm -hmm. So just go search for debt payoff calculator, plug in your numbers, and you can play around. If you put $50 a month extra, sometimes you can cut that down by years. Yep. This is shocking to people. And the second thing is don't count on anything happening from the government. If it happens, fantastic. Bonus. Bonus. Agreed. But don't. Hope is not a strategy when it comes to your money. Yep, I love it. Investing, you had already mentioned financial advisors, yeah. just the management fees. Obviously, those are things that are so critical to be aware of. Yeah. But that's that's even like three steps Yeah, ahead. let me give you one. People don't even know where to start with investing in general. Hey, I have some money, where do I go? What are your thoughts? Here's what I tell my family. My family comes to me, they go, where should I invest? First of all, I'm like, have you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> I have a ton of chapters on this. <laughs> My favorite investment for them is something called a target date fund. Yeah. It's so simple. It's one investment yeah. and that is all you need. Let me tell you how it works. So depending on how old you're going to be, what year you are going to turn 65, mm -hmm. you pick the fund by the same name. Let's say I'm going to turn 65 in 2050. Sure. So I'm going to go pick a fund called Vanguard 2050 or Fidelity 2050 or Schwab 2050. This fund automatically is diversified. It includes all kinds of stocks, bonds, everything. And as you get older, it automatically becomes a little bit more conservative, which you want as you get older. Right. All you have to do is pick the fund based on age and then put as much money as possible into it. This fund is low cost. It requires nothing. You, don't, you do not need to look at it. I spend less than one hour per month on my finances and it works. That is, the, that is what I tell my family to do when it comes to starting off investing. Okay, now more than ever though, there are so many of these target funds yeah. that are under, under different groups and based on who it's being managed by, the fee might not be low cost. So do you have any recommendations yeah. of what type of target funds and where you should look for them? Yeah, well, personally, I don't get any benefit from naming any of these companies, but I love Vanguard. They're focused on low cost and their expense ratio, the fee, I just checked it the other day. It's like 0.08%. That is essentially free. Yeah, you can't okay. beat that. In general, you want to look at these funds at less than 0.2% fee because they're so competitive. They're almost nothing now. Yeah. I would not do it through a bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. First of all, fuck those banks. Okay, they're predatory. <laughs> I hate them. And second of all, you do not want to do your investments through a bank because they need your fees to pay for all their real estate offices employees. Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, all great companies that are low cost. And there's others as well, but those are the three that I tend to name. I name names in my book and that's why I'm doing it here too. Take on robo-advisors. I don't mind robo advisors. I personally don't think that they are worth it. Okay. But if your choice is between a Vanguard fund and a robo advisor like Wealthfront or Betterment, honestly, 
you're already asking the right questions. Okay. Some people really prefer the nice interface on a robo advisor, but for the additional fee, in my opinion, I wouldn't do it, I don't do it, but if you really wanna do it, okay. Okay, interesting. So many different takes on everything A to Z when it comes to money management. I think these are all really good places to start too. Like can if I, you're, yeah. Can right. I teach you, I, I wanna share a quick little cocktail party trick. These are yes. the kind of cocktail parties yes. I go to. Here's a little math trick you can use to see how much money you will have. This is actually quite shocking. So the rule of 72, 72 divided by your return rate is how many years it will take you to double your money. So over the last 70, 80 years, the S&P 500 has returned about 10% per year, mm -hmm. okay? Minus inflation, it's 7%, whatever. Yeah. Let's just say 10% for easy math. That means your money's gonna double every seven years. Let's play the math real quick. Let's say you put $5,000 in today and you never touch it again. 5,000 turns into 10,000 in seven years. That's fine. 10,000 turns into 20. 20 turns into 40, 40 into 80, 80 into 160. Soon you are making more money from your investments than you are from your salary. And you have to remember that most people do not just invest once and stop, they keep investing. Yeah. So if you ever go and search for investment calculator or compound interest calculator, you can plug in your numbers. I use 7% for a return rate okay. and you just plug it in like $100 a month yeah. for 30 years. And you know the numbers are nominal, but then you go 200, 300, 500. What if I get a raise? Should I put an extra 5,000 in there? And you will quickly see when you will become a millionaire when you will make more money from your investments than your salary. And suddenly you realize it's pointless to debate over the price of coffee. You got <laughs> millions of dollars sitting over here. Let's focus on that. Making money fun again. Exactly. All right, this also connects, I think a lot of your principles and your rules and your strategies connect to the way you think, but the way you think is also different than a lot of the personal financial advisors out there, a lot of the people that are giving personal finance tips. So of the personal financial tips you see mm. out in either the influencer space or the blogging space or the TV space, what are some of like the biggest financial no-nos that you see <laughs> personal financial individuals putting out 24 seven? Okay, number one, that whole life insurance is some secret way of making <laughs> a bunch of money. It's a crock of BS. bullshit. <laughs> yeah, whole life insurance is one of the worst products out there. Yeah. There's actually no reason for anyone to be doing it. If you need insurance, term life insurance get is great. Insurance. Yeah, get insurance. Don't overpay for exactly. it. Exactly, <laughs> insurance is not an investment. Listen up, insurance is not an investment. You're getting ripped off. That's number one. Number two, the idea that you should pay a financial advisor 1% or 1.5%. This is very common, but most people do not realize how destructive it is. Let me give you an example. Yes. If you pay 1% to a financial advisor, you go, oh, 1%, somebody's looking over my money, that sounds good to mm -hmm. me. 1% means that 28% of your long-term returns will go into their pocket as fees. That's more expensive than all the coffee you will ever buy combined. <laughs> it's, good comparison. it's more expensive than all the vacations you will ever take combined. And, you know, I remember this young woman who wrote me, she was 31, she was paying 1%. And she thought, she had no idea how much it would actually cost her. She thought it would be like $30,000 over the next 30 years. Yeah. She said, that sounds reasonable. I calculated it for her. It was $315,000. So imagine she had been going to the grocery store, comparison shopping, finding the best can of tuna, and all that was pointless right. compared to the fee that she was invisibly paying. So... Most of us do not need a financial advisor. Get the book, manage it yourself. But if you really want one, pay two, three, four, even $500 an hour. Happily pay it. Yeah. Instead of AUM, in other words, a percentage based fee. Okay. Because I was going to say, I think a common, I, th I love the idea, but I think a common retort to that would be, I'm not an expert. I don't have time to be an expert. I got to do what I'm going to do. What no. would your response to that argument no, be? No, that's bullshit. Okay, I don't <laughs> accept that. Imagine we have two parents in here and one of them, both of them go, I'm not an expert at this baby. Here, somebody take care of this baby. I go, what? Uh, what are you yeah, talking yeah. about? That's yeah. your kid. <laughs> be an expert. Your money is yeah. one of the core, most important things in your life, whether you are single or in a relationship. It is not the equivalent to washing the dishes, with, which maybe you have somebody come and do, or mowing the lawn. Okay, you can outsource that. Money is what you eat, where you live, 
what your children can do. It is as important as almost anything. And so you've got to know the basic language of money. You do not need to pay the vast majority unless you have a very large portfolio, sure. a highly complex situation. You don't need to do it. And honestly, the reason most people go, oh, I, I don't understand this stuff, is they think that by paying someone, they're going to get some magical knowledge. Right, right. They're not. They're not. Paying someone is never going to get you better long-term returns than a simple target date or index fund. The other interesting thing is I think the whole conversation of fiduciary comes up, but there's also so many what I'll call actors out there saying that fiduciaries, but if you're in a fiduciary account, you yeah. could have the same exact thing like a target rate yes. in a brokerage or yes. account that you'd get, you know, let, you let me explain much what you just fees. said, because I think there's a lot of jargon there, but I want to explain it. Yeah. This is how crazy the financial industry is. There used to be a law saying you have to be a fiduciary, which means you will put your clients first. <laughs> what? Like what? <laughs> what else How am I paying for? Is that? Exactly. Like when you go to see the doctor, you expect them to put you first. You just ex you don't even ask because you just expect right. it. Well, it turns out Wall Street did not like that rule, <laughs> so they went and they fought it, and they their argument was actually. If you force us to be fiduciaries and to be clear about it, we will not be able to serve as many people. <laughs> what a bunch of bullshit. And so now there are so many different terms, fee only, all different terms, that it's by arguing so many times against clear transparency, Wall Street has earned the ire of average people. You can't trust them. Right. So now the word fiduciary has been corrupted. Right. Financial advisors, while there are some very good ones charging an hourly fee, I simply have a blanket refusal for any of my students to pay AUM or a percentage-based fee. Okay, interesting. Hourly only. Yeah, no hourly AUM. or per project. 200 bucks an hour, pay it. Pay, and happily pay it because there are great advisors who will look out for you, put your interest first. They will not sell you larded up funds where they might be making money on the front end, the back end, and in ways you can't even imagine. Gotcha, so takeaway there, unless you're at the ultra high net worth position, yeah. manage yourself, do it yourself. Were yeah. there any other misconceptions you wanted to make sure that you put on the record? Whole life, I interrupted to ask. Whole life insurance, we talked about 1% AUM. Oh, I knew there was one, I could There's feel it. It was at okay. the tip of your tongue. So here we are in New York. So let's say we wanna go to some cheap sushi place. We can get cheap sushi. If we pay more, we're gonna get better sushi. Sure. And if we pay a lot more, we'll get better service, better ambiance. The sushi's probably flown in from Tokyo yesterday. Okay. Most of us are used to, if we pay more, we get better service or results. Correct. But in money, it's actually not true. Tell me why. And this is shocking. <laughs> you can't believe it. Look, if you pay more expensive, you'll get a softer blend, sure, et cetera. Yeah. In money, the more you pay, you do not get better results. And this drives people insane. When you pay more, even for ultra high net worth, okay. the ultra high net worth do not have access to magical investments that make them more than a simple Vanguard index fund. They do have access to more investments, that is true. Yeah. But those investments have fees that are way higher than Vanguard's 0.05%. They're way riskier. Some of them perform better in the short term, but almost none of them perform better in the long term. And here's the final twist. Even of the ones that do perform really well, you can't predict which ones they are. And even if you could, they won't take your money. You can have $30 million and Sequoia Capital does not want your money. They will not let you in their fund. Yeah. So this is shocking. When I post about this and I show people Look, they're not these secret rich people investments. <laughs> you, the average person, has access to some of the most fantastic investments out there. People get furious. They want to believe that the rich have secret access. The rich do have certain benefits, which I don't like. The rich, including me, should be taxed more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense mm -hmm. that I'm taxed at the rate I am. But in terms of investments, I could choose a lot of investments, private equity, venture capital. Yeah. I love a nice Vanguard fund. Interesting. Pick it, same as anybody else, and get on with our rich lives. But what would be your response to like hedge funds that have outperformed Hedge funds are shit. They underperform the S&P. I'll tell you, that's exactly a great, there's a great New Yorker article on hedge funds. 
everybody thinks hedge funds are these super cool things. They outperform. <laughs> Some of them do yeah. for a while. Okay. You can't predict which ones will ahead of time. Of course. Yeah. And then they all go down. Yeah, it's a roller coaster. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if you happen to be lucky, you could make more than the Vanguard fund or a sure. Schwab fund. Sure. But you can't predict it. Yeah. And odds are, especially for what's called a retail investor, that's a nice way of saying yeah. dumb money. Yeah. It's like ma and pa. That's, that's the way Wall Street talks then you can't actually predict and consistently make more than a simple low cost index fund. Again, this is shocking to people. They go, I pay more, I get better sushi. So why can't I pay more like those rich people do? I, I go, those rich people are actually losing money. <laughs> they don't know it. But the, but the people who are investing in these things often do it for different reasons. They want the status of yep. being in a certain fund. Mm -hmm. They get served coffee on a fancy tray, <laughs> believe it or not, that actually is influential to yeah. people. Status drives more consumption than you would imagine. But you will get, let me ask you this though, in those situations, when you do have more money under management, you'll get, you know, they will have the ability because there's profitable P&Ls elsewhere that they're making the fees up, but no mortgage origination, less fee basis for a AUM. Like there are certain perks to it, right? I'll, I'll give you the like example of the perks. someone in private wealth banking yeah. or ultra, they're going to get perks that so, were like someone else may not. A retail so investor would. I'll give you examples because I have had access to private banks. So I was there for a while. I go, what do I get? <laughs> what do I get? That's actually a good question for every one of us to ask. Put your hand out and say, what do I Tell get? Tell me, spell yeah. it out for me. Yeah. And I'm like, what are the cool, like, what are the cool, like yeah. rich guy perks? It's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you right now. If I wanted to get a mortgage, yes, that is true. They would have given me a preferential rate on mortgages. Okay. That's true. And at a very high amount, that could start to be meaningful. Sure. But sometimes you can get those same rates from a credit union. Okay, so that's one option. That's probably the most influential. All the rest of the benefits are designed to make the bank money. They go, we will give you preferred access to our investment group. I go, your investment group is shit. <laughs> they sell the worst funds. They have back-end fees, expense ratios out of this universe, and you're telling me I get preferential access? That's like someone giving me preferential access to a butcher. Oh, we'll <laughs> let you get your hand cut off first. I go, why the fuck would I want that? <laughs> no, these private banks are- What's the response to your, your response? What I, I'll say? tell you, I, I had a call with Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. private wealth management, yeah. These two, they had this beautiful British accent. Yeah. They called me. This is in my book. I wrote about this. <clears throat> they called me and they they knew that I was some sort of, they thought I was like a celebrity bit or business owner. Okay. That's their two primary clientele. They're based out of Beverly Hills. And without even asking me any questions about myself, they start, they launched into their spiel. Now, I loved it. I yeah, pretended. You're going to have a field day with Yeah, this. I pretended to not know anything <laughs> about money. Come true. I was like, I, I started asking like these, these questions that I knew a celebrity would ask. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, so what can you do to protect my money? <laughs> and then I was, you know, I was like, you know, I've heard about investing. I, I, I know I should be investing, but I don't want to lose too much of my money. This is gold <laughs> to them because what they hear is basically a sucker. A sucker who they, that, which is exactly how they treated me, they go, you know what? Our goal with managing money is not to beat the market, but rather to keep your money safe. Because people who don't know anything about money love to hear the word safe. safe. Yeah. Okay. We keep your money safe, we manage it for you, and we can open up preferential opportunities for you because we know that you want to keep your eyes focused on your business and we can watch out for your money. Now that sounds really good, especially in a British accent. Meanwhile, I'm like, <laughs> You motherfuckers, <laughs> I can read between the lines. Let me tell you what they just said in plain English. They said, we are going to underperform a simple S&P index fund. We're going to charge a you shit ton for it. <laughs> a ton of money to get you worse results. And then we're going to give you more sales opportunities where you can pay us more on the back end. I go, are you insane? But if you don't know the language of money, you walk out of there going, oh my God, I that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, but the way I felt was like, these guys are you're, two steps yeah. away from putting a bullet in my head. Yeah, but their strategy is to make you feel relaxed. Exactly, you feel because relaxed. they go, you're a busy business owner. Yeah. You want to focus on your business. Yeah. You know that blah, blah, blah. I go, right. and, and the irony is they tried to put me, because I asked them some very simple questions. I was like, how would you invest for somebody like me? And <laughs> the stuff they were telling me was so insane. Yeah. I, I had to stop from laughing. They were talking about putting me in, heavy bond mixes yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Why the fuck would you put a 30 year old? I was 30 at the time. A 30 year old entrepreneur in bar. It makes no sense. Terrible. But of course, they thought I was stupid. Right. And they thought maybe not even stupid, just unsavvy. Sure. And so they treated me accordingly. And this is what I mean by I wish it were just a little easier. I wish that when people started to manage their money, they didn't have to walk into a room of sharks. Yeah. Ironically, sometimes when I tell people how simple it actually can be, they actually get skeptical of me. Because, because it's the opposite of everything they've been told. Exactly. When I go, you don't need to pay a financial advisor 1.25% AUM. You do not need whole life insurance because it's complete bullshit. You can manage this on your own and you can do it in less than one hour per month. They almost look at me like, what's the catch? I go, don't yeah. look at me. Yeah, look go at talk them. to your banker. <laughs> Ask them what's the catch. In fact, if you're listening right now, I want you to text either your financial advisor yep. or if your parents have one, have your parents text them. And just say this. Hey... I was just reviewing my accounts and I'm curious, how much are you charging me for our work together? Now, if you get an answer that is direct and clear, it says something like 200 bucks an hour or 2000 bucks a year, sure. fantastic. Great. You're not gonna get that answer. You're gonna get them saying either, can we hop on the phone? Let's walk through it all together. They don't want it in writing. Or they're gonna say something with a vague answer, go right back at them and say, I totally understand that. Just want to get the fee. Can you clarify it for me? If you see a percentage, you are paying way too much, way too much. Guys, there are so many tips there. I could keep going and going and ask you a million more because I love the passion. I love the energy. And I also love just the fact that you're breaking the mold of talking differently about this. You're doing it differently than what everybody else is saying. And why is the most important asset, the thing that makes the world go round something still in 2023, something we don't talk about, taboo, fear. And I think because the more we talk about it, the more information people are getting to defend themselves, the less they're making. That is my conclusion from this conversation. All right, we gotta get a trading secret. So you've given us a lot, but it's gonna be a trading secret about, it could be money management, it could be your personal financial situation, career management, just the behind the scenes of reality TV, any type of trading secret that could help our viewers, the Money Mafia, get a little bit more information from all the experiences you've had. Ramit, what can you leave us with? My favorite thing, is every December, my wife and I do a rich life review. So we take some time, we try to go somewhere that's different than our normal setting. And we look at the past year and we go, what was awesome? What do we wanna do again? What was not awesome? What do we wanna change? And we just talk openly about it. No judgment, just open. And then we look at next year. Where do, we love to travel, so we go, where do we wanna travel? How often? Who do we want to bring with us? Mm -hmm. And that December allows us to just chart our rich life looking forward while taking into account everything that we did from the past. That has allowed us to take amazing trips, bring our family together, just things that I wouldn't have done if I was just going day by day. So whether it is going to a restaurant, taking a trip, a surprise dinner for somebody, even sending a little gift, this December Rich Life Review, you can do it solo, you can do it with a partner. It allows you to go on offense with your money instead of only playing defense. And I hope that everybody takes a little time to plot out what they want their rich life to be. I love it. And as we learned in this episode, if you hear those things about living your rich life and you get a little nervous because you have to spend, think about where you can make all that up with a lot more zeros than just Target or Starbucks. There's a lot to be said for that. Ramit, it has been such a pleasure to have you on. You have so much going on. There's so much to promote, but where can people find everything you got going on? You can find everything on my website. I will teach you to be rich. And of course, I'm on Netflix and I'm on social media and and I'm on my podcast, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Check out his book, his podcast, his Netflix, his Netflix show. I'm sure you guys have just like stacks of notes after this and go follow him on Instagram because he is growing by the second. Thank you so much for being here on Trade Secrets. Thanks so much.